Hello, bonjour, bonsoir. Welcome to Tea With Me, my interview series of conversations via video chat with creatives under quarantine. I want to speak with people about how they are doing what they are doing during this COVID-19 crisis. It is no frills, real talk over tea. And uh, tonight, I'm looking forward to speaking with Jovanka Vukovic, who I know as the horror expert and enthusiast. He's also a filmmaker, the director of Riot Girls, and um, you may know the all-female horror anthology, The XX. She's also a business owner. She co-founded the Telltale Heart Tattoo Shop and Art Gallery in Burlington. We're going to hear about how all of that is doing. Welcome, Jovanka, to Tea With Me here on YouTube. It's been a very long time. I haven't seen you uh, since you've gone blonde. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for having me. Yes, since, I, since I've had red, it's been a while since I've had red hair. I know. What do you think? I've, I've, I've kind of grown into it. I think it's glamorous. <laughs> people tell me people keep telling me that it is um that i'm less intimidating with blonde hair which makes me want to go back to red but uh you know it's just such a pain in the ass i, I got tired of like traveling with black pillowcases and black towels and you know how it is right <laughs> i would love to have red hair it's a lot of work so i've had the same hair for 20 years and when people tell me I'm intimidating, I say, what am I supposed to do with that information? I don't know. Thanks for telling me. That's, that's your problem, right? Yeah. So, uh, my tea. I got my tea. Yeah. So tell me about your mug and what you're drinking. Uh, Famous Monsters magazine, you know, the, the original, the OG horror magazine, right? Um, Forrest Ackerman. I don't know. I just randomly picked it. It was that or Blade Runner. And I thought, well, I'm talking to Lisa, so we'll go horror. And I'm drinking chai tea with soy milk. I know, you think you know somebody, right? <laughs> Drink it over regular milk. Okay, so here's a story before I tell you about my tea. I okay. once interviewed Brett Michaels from Poison. Okay. And there's, a bit, of a, there's <laughs> a bit of a long story. He was, he's very media savvy. Okay. So he had invited me to spend, uh, like, follow him around Toronto and then go to the show. And uh, again, he works the journalist. He's super friendly. But we're on the bus. And I see in the mini fridge in the bus, it's full of, like, almond milk. And <laughs> like, um, it was almond milk or soy milk or whatever at the time. And he said, please don't put that in your article. <laughs> like, I don't want people thinking that, like, I'm in the, on the bus, like, you know, drinking healthy drinks. So, oh, my God, that's funny. That's but I'm funny. sure now it probably wouldn't be such a big deal. No, I love it, though. But, you know, how was the show? <laughs> was it good? Poison? Was it that first Poison reunion that they it was did? Like, it was nothing but a good time. You know, yeah. <laughs> 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 I think the problem was Vince Neil may have been also on the bill and he was oh here but poison was a lot of fun I'm not gonna lie I picked this mug for you because oh. even though uh I know you as um a writer and a filmmaker and a tattoo shop owner and all these things I also know you as the woman who draws a penis on the outside of my Christmas card <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, you have a certain, so, mug, so I, I, I pick, I picked this mug. Okay. I love it. <laughs> the only mug I have that swears. Um, <laughs> and my tea is an herbal blueberry tea from celestial seasons from the grocery store. Uh, because apparently you're not supposed to drink caffeine at night, which I do a lot. So I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to have what are we 90 <laughs> years old like what is going on what has become of us yeah i can't drink caffeine after like 12 noon or else i don't sleep at night either i've become super super sensitive to kind of like any chemicals stimulants whatever i don't drink i don't smoke i don't do drugs and so yeah and i go to bed really early <laughs> Well, as I'm saying lately, this is a no judgment zone. I think we all yeah. need to just let all that go. Um, I want to ask you some questions uh, tonight about 
where you're at in this age of of COVID-19. My first question is, where are you physically? Like, where are you sheltering and who are you with? I am sheltering in my in my home. Um, I actually was uh, directing a television series in Vancouver when um, we when we got shut down, and um, I was on a plane like six hours later. I just sent everybody home, um, and I've been um, sheltering in in place with my husband Shane and my daughter ever since, who is um, ten next month, if you can believe it. And we have been uh, homeschooling her and slightly regretting putting her in French immersion because half of her studies are uh, in French. And so, uh, <laughs> uh, they, you know, the lessons, science and social studies and stuff are in French. And so it's, it just it adds an extra layer of difficulty when I'm trying to teach her. I'm, we are doing the best that we can. <laughs> Um, taking it day by day, just like everyone else. You know, I feel like I've, I've lived through a lifetime of, of emotions in just these past couple of months. Like it, it feels like everything. And, uh, um, um, <clears throat> some days are good and some days are bad. Uh, I have this little office in my house that I made in the basement of my house that I made last year. I was like, okay, I'm finally going to create a, a, a tiny writing space for myself. Right. And it's just like, um, you know, some, some books and a comfortable couch and a, and a desk where I can write. Cause I remember rereading Stephen King's book on writing. And he was saying like, you need to give yourself a writing space. And I'm one of those people, I need to be able to shut the door and close myself in so that I can get any work done. And it was a really good decision because now I'm, I'm co-writing a screenplay with a, a writer who lives in the US and we're passing 10 pages back and forth, which has been really fun. I didn't think I would like it, but it's been really fun. And I do that in here. Um, so I just, you know, hide out and yes, this. So I wallpapered my, this, this wall with pages from an old copy of Richard Matheson's I Am Legend. The, as you know, <laughs> as you know, one of the most important vampire stories ever written, probably one of, one of the most important, um, you know, uh, touchstone horror stories ever written because it inspired um, George Romero to make Night of the Living Dead. And it's just, it's one of my favorite, one of my favorite stories. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go too far down the, the hole before um, asking you uh, about your fundraising campaign that is going right. on right now, because uh, it's urgent. So I want to make sure that, that people hear about that before, before we start to nerd out. So you've launched a GoFundMe in support of your tattoo shop and art gallery. So can you tell us about the Telltale Heart, what it is? Opened a tattoo studio and art gallery with my husband four years ago, um, you know, in, in this small town that we, well, it's not really a small town, the city that we live in just outside of Toronto, uh, because we, there's nothing like that here. And we really wanted to bring some kind of like, you know, um, some of our sort of artistic sensibility because we know that there's other people nearby that um, also are interested or share our interests. And so I, you know, we built that place with our bare hands and really it does not look like a tattoo shop. It's like, you know, wainscoting and flocked black on black flocked wallpaper. We took a lot of the stuff that all the sort of collectibles and fine arts that we, fine art that we had in our home and just sort of festooned the place so that every piece of it is a work of art. Um, it does not, you know, th there's nothing like it else in the world. And we're, we're so proud of it. And so in addition to sort of like, uh, obviously the, you know, horror themed tattoos and the stuff that comes out of there, we also do art shows. So I've had, um, I've had shows in there where my, our, our, our grand opening show, we had four, so five original oil paintings by Clive Barker. And that was the first time he'd ever showed anywhere in Canada was in our little studio. We've shown Ch Chet Czar, who's a um, very well-known dark artist. Um, Nat Jones, um, th th we've had local artists too. Andrea Hunter, who's a photographer. She tours around a lot with Burlington's own uh, Walk Off the Earth. 
Mm -hmm. um, and she makes these really cool kind of pinup, dark pinup portraits. Um, so the place is really important to us. It's one of those unique stores. Um, and I've visited a lot of the, these types of places around the world. You know, that one little shop like Dario Argento's shop in Rome, Profondo Rosso, or the Oblong Box in uh, San Diego, and Dark Delicacies in Los Angeles. And, you know, like I've visited these places and, and um, they're so special. And uh, I wanted to open one of my own. So, um, and unfortunately, due to the COVID crisis, uh, we had to close on March 13th. Um, like we had to shut our doors and uh, lay off all of our staff. And unfortunately, um, our, the shop's income came to a grinding halt because we don't have anything to sell other than tattoos and fine art. And people need to actually physically come in to get tattooed. And that's just a really dangerous thing. Um, we're still trying to figure out going forward what the new version of tattooing is going to be. We're having a big, huge uh, plexiglass window installed in the front, you know, to protect our, our counter girl. Um, but the good news is we started this, we started this uh, GoFundMe three days ago and we're like 90% there already, 91%. It's just been incredible seeing the community, uh, our friends, our family, clients, strangers, people that I didn't even know, like the parents of other kids that you know go to my daughter's school that I didn't even know that we knew that we owned this place have all pitched in because they really don't want to see us lose it. And they don't want to see the five people that work there be out of work, right? Um, and so thankfully, because of this enormous, uh, wave of support uh, we're going to be able to afford to keep the place closed for a couple more months and and um, rehire our staff when it's safe because that's yeah. what, that's what it's about right it's just if you don't yeah. have any income if you don't have any revenue coming in for the business just sort of keeping the lights on keeping afloat until you can reopen right getting that 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 safety net right yeah the well the largest expense you know with any brick and mortar store is rent most of us especially tattoo studios um we're we're hurting and like what what small businesses have like um an emergency fund to stay closed for six months with zero dollars coming in none right um so this is going to save us this is gonna save us and make a huge difference in the lives of uh, all the people that work there. Um, I'm oh, eternally I, grateful. Thank you to everybody who's donated. If you're watching this and you've donated, I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> well, <laughs> Aren't you scary to cry, right, Lisa? <laughs> well, it's a testament to community, right? The idea that it's not just a business. That yeah is a community of people like i don't have a lot of tattoos certainly compared to you know most of the folks in your circle but everyone i have was done by amanda who works at at telltale heart right and, you know i care about her and i want her to keep doing you know what she does for all of us um and you know i've been to not lately but i've been to art openings at your place and it you wouldn't expect that in a place like Burlington. So, you know, you're building something from the ground up and if those businesses disappear, they're not gonna be replaced by another business like that. They're gonna be oh. replaced by another, you know, Shoppers Drug Mart or Starbucks or something, right? Yeah, which is just, which is just gross, right? <laughs> There's creativity though in, in, in this duress under this trauma. You know, yeah. what, what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing in these challenging times is people rising to the occasion with creativity and, and innovation. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what you think is going to happen in the film business, because as you said, your production was shut down. Um, I like, when are they going to be able to make the next season of a TV show or when are they going to be able to finish a film? Um, that's being made. So there's production, and then of course there's distribution. When are the theaters gonna reopen again? Like, what do you think is gonna happen for the film industry for the rest of 2020? 
it's funny because that's all I've been we've been doing uh, during this time off is uh, is development and a lot of like a lot of Zoom calls and with executives and like no one knows everybody is the consensus is is like everyone is scared you know and they're some of them are scared for their jobs the longer this goes on the more obsolete they start to feel you know um but there's but you know the only way they're making money right now is through writers um development right there's they're still they're still selling um we're st still selling shows and still um writers rooms are still happening there's no production happening so you know there's this the development side is all that's happening. Um, there's probably going to be like a big, huge buying, you know, boom at the end of this. Um, but nobody knows like when we're going to be able to get back to work. Like I said, I was, you know, I, I finally, you know, after years had broken into directing episodic television and was directing a series in Vancouver when, when we got shut down and I was on a plane home uh, eight hours later. Um, which was absolutely the right choice and the right decision. Um, but we don't know when that's going to start up again. Um, I don't know. Everybody's hoping that it'll be a couple of months, you know, but uh, when will it be safe and what will the production production models look like? How will we be able to, what's the insurance situation going to be like, how will we be able to ensure that people can come to work and be safe? Cause when I was on set, we were doing exactly the opposite of what the CDC was suggesting, which was, you know, they were saying don't travel and don't uh, gather in groups of over 150. And I'm like literally shoulder to shoulder <laughs> with, with the crew and these like, you know, on these sets and stuff, which is exactly why they shut us down and sent us home. Right. Um, so I, I really don't know. Um, I, I really don't know how it's going to, no clue. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about what you're afraid of in this situation. People always ask horror writers, what are you afraid of? <laughs> uh, what were you initially most afraid of and has that changed as we are now in like week six or seven of all of this? Um, I was afraid that I was going to be uh, stuck in Vancouver, separated from my family. You know, I was afraid that I was going to... Um, just be stuck in a hotel room um, and not be able to see um, my husband and daughter during this really scary time. They, they really wanted me home. My daughter was texting me saying, mommy, I'm scared, come home. School's closed. Everybody is at home with their families, <laughs> you know? So um, I, was, I was afraid that, you know, Shane uh, would get sick. Um, it's one of the reasons we were, the, we were the first tattoo shop in the city to close. We talked about this one night after wrap. I called him and, and, and I said, you, you know, we've, we've got to close the tattoo shop. It's just, it's too scary. And, and I, I was afraid that if, if he got sick, who would take care of Violet? I'm, I'm in Vancouver. I don't even know when I'm going to be home and, and, you know, if they'll let me fly home. And so all that kind of stuff, you know, was flying through my head. Um, and it's also the thing that scares me about reopening, um, reopening even the tattoo shop before it's safe is, is, um, you know, somebody I care about or one of the people that works in the shops getting, getting sick just because, you know, they need to make money, you know, and that's, that sucks. <laughs> this, this, <laughs> that anybody w would have to risk their lives just to put food on the table. I don't really know what to say about that, you know? I mean, that's what the, these, um, the grocery store workers and all the first responders and everybody who's out there right now while we're inside, that's exactly what they're doing. And I have like, a, you know, a lot of feelings about that, right? <laughs> I, I remember seeing the announcement that you guys were closing. This was before businesses were told they had to close. Um, there were tattoo shops that were still operating in my neighborhood probably a week after you guys closed. Um, and yeah, I think about the essential workers all the time and, you know, all of the TV ads calling them heroes. It's like, yeah, there are definitely people doing heroic things right now. Most people do not want to be heroically packaging your Amazon order. <laughs> no. They don't have a choice. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah, there, there, and I, I thought about the, you know, when we got shut down, I thought about the crew. I was heartbroken for the crew because they are, you know, they're, uh, many of them, you know, they're, they work so hard and many of them are work, work paycheck to paycheck in the film business and they don't get um, any kind of, any kind of uh, insurance or any, any money uh, in addition to that, that, the check for that week. So, um, it's just, it's a terrible situation all around. I think about them every day, you know, wondering how they're, how they're getting by. <clears throat> Do you think scary stories will change? Like we know looking back at, at, the, at the sociological factors that influenced everything from Frankenstein to George Romero zombie movies. And now we're in this unique situation and I wonder if people are going to want more scary stories, less scary stories. I don't want to hear anything about the plague. What do you think is going to happen? That's the one great thing about the horror genre is that it endures. It's, it's never kind of lost. It kind of, you know, is cyclical a bit in terms of like how well it does in theaters. But scary stories, you know, are always popular. <laughs> you, can, you can just take a cursory glance over, you know, um, the history of horror and see kind of by decade more or less what we were afraid of during that time collectively right and it'll be really interesting to see what emerges out of you know uh the president trump era <laughs> and this um bizarre you know um situation that we're in right now um i don't think that people need to write i think that's bullshit to kind of like um put that pressure on people i think a lot of people are deservedly down you know depressed if it's not clinical then at least it like low lying you know like low level depression and i think it's important to listen to i think it's important to listen to your body um you know there are some days where i don't get anything done i just spend the entire day in my pajamas and i and i'm you know, with my kid playing video games, watching TV, and can barely even muster the energy to go and walk the dog outside. So, um, I don't know. I think people need to give themselves a break, right? <laughs> the, st the scary stories will come. They will come. <laughs> they will be written, but you don't have to, you know, nobody needs to write Frankenstein right now, <laughs> right? The next Frankenstein or whatever. Just take it one day at a time and be kind to yourself. That's, that's all you can really do. Like, I only think about the weekend ahead. I oh, don't okay. really think about, like, what am I going to do in May? You know, mm -hmm. if I start to think about the summer and then I'll think about my camping plans that are canceled or, like, my, I was going to go cycling in Italy in April. Oh my god! Obviously, that canceled. I don't. You you think way further ahead than I do. I'm I'm like one a, one day at a time, <laughs> one day at a time. Otherwise, it's too overwhelming. I wake up and I say, "Do I have a dry cough? Is my <laughs> is my mom sick? Okay, we're good." Yeah. 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 I yeah. Is your mom? That must be difficult because your mom lives in a small town that's kind of far away right from you um it's not that far it's that i don't drive so right. um i haven't seen my mom since this all happened it's not like i can just go and wave at her like yeah the porch. um i missed her birthday i'm gonna miss mother's day um but we've started video chatting and that's oh, not something good. we had ever done before because of you know technological challenges with my mom but I forced her on her birthday to get WhatsApp and we had a video chat and she laughed and thought it was really fun. And it's been one of the good things to come out of this that now we can, we can see each other um, more often actually than before. Cause now my dad, my dad is 80, uh, he's 80, <laughs> 80 year old Serbian guy and he lives nearby. So I drop off groceries for him, but he, we've been video chatting as well. It's pretty funny to chat with like it's like this it's like he yells he yells as if and i i think that's where i get it because people tell me i'm loud on 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 video calls 
but he yells as if he's like, you know, on, on a, on a phone from like, you know, 1910, you know, and, and he's like this, he's talking like, you know, I'm, I'm, yelling, mom, like, yelling at me in Serbian like this, you know, <laughs> when I'm doing video calls with my mom, it's like, mom, I can only see like half of your face. <laughs> but you know what i love it i love it anyway. yeah well you know he needs to see it helps him to see his granddaughter and you know it makes him because he's the poor guy he's all alone you know he's like my mom passed away a couple of years ago so he's all by himself in there i feel so bad for him you know i have shane and violet and and the dog you know who's like almost a person he's 135 pounds <laughs> it's like another person in the house <laughs> Um, I, I want to ask you uh, something that's been on my mind, which is I've been trying to figure out for myself because I have up and down days for sure. And I've definitely like lied on the floor crying at night with the lights off, like listening to music or whatever, um, more than one time. But I feel like overall I'm handling it pretty well. And I think I wonder if it's because I've been obsessively thinking about death and and my own mortality for most of my adult life and I wonder <laughs> if other morbid people are in a similar boat so like what do you think if, if you've had a chance to think about this that having a life surrounded by horror stories fantasy fiction historical um has this affected your ability to kind of weather this storm or you know do you think that it affects you I don't know. I don't know because I've been, I've had, you know, um, this horrible fear, like, you know, my worry and fear about dying, I think is like worse than most people. <laughs> I, I wake up in the middle of the night, even before this, you know, like for years, you know, in sweats thinking about dying. Like I, I'm afraid of getting a wasting disease, something like cancer. So I wrote, I wrote a script about a woman who has terminal brain cancer, who essentially cheats death. She has to kill five people in order to cure her brain cancer. Um, that's how I think I get this stuff out of me. Um, but I, I definitely have a, you know, uh, unhealthy <laughs> obsession with thoughts about my own death. It's weird. I think, um, that's interesting because it's actually the reverse, my assumption reverse. So the idea being that like, because you read and write stories about death makes you more equipped to handle it. It's actually the opposite because <laughs> you have a fear, you're more equipped to write stories. Like the stories actually help. It's, it's, yeah, it's something Stuart, to think about. Yeah. Stuart Gordon, uh, who, you know, recently passed away, um, used to say that, horror movies were like uh rehearsals for our own deaths every one of his horror movies were rehearsals for our own deaths and i always loved that um maybe maybe that's what we're doing right but it i don't feel any less scared of dying i think that's the atheist's curse right mm -hmm. i don't have it's like an awful conversation you have to have with your 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 children is that yes you will die one day and uh, no, you probably aren't going to sprout wings and fly up into the sky. Nobody knows what happens. Uh, but it's probably just kind of like a cease to exist scenario. <laughs> and try, try to sugarcoat that for your kid when they ask you. It's awful. <laughs> um, at least if I had some kind of faith, I could like, you know, believe the lie, you know, and, and give her like this comforting answer of like, oh, it's going to be fine. We're all going to be in heaven together. Everything's going to be great. But that's, you know, we, we believe in science and, you know, and that's who we are as a family. And death is real. It's a part of life. And poor Violet suffers with uh, severe, you know, life-threatening food allergies. So I think she has a lot more anxiety about death and dying than most kids, which breaks my, breaks my fucking heart every day. Um, but all we can do uh, is, um, especially now, uh, is validate her, make sure she knows that her feelings are valid when they come up right um she'll have days where she's just really down and she'll say this mommy this is 
this is just, this is wrong what's happening. Like, why is this happening? And you can see her trying to process it. And, and um, we just try to be there for her and comfort her and, 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 and ensure that she knows that her, her feelings are valid. You know, I think we all need that right now. <laughs> yeah, I believe in science. And yeah. my hope is that we are in the natural life cycle of this virus. And it will, yeah. you know, just like past plagues, we will survive. Um, yeah. So we just have to kind of hang on until that yeah. pull the line. Just don't want to, um, you know, make, you know, reopen the economy at the expense of 30% of the population or something insane like that. <laughs> right? It's really insane. Um, I want to end possibly on, on a positive note. Yeah, it's all this talk about death and tea is just so depressing. Death and viruses and tea. <laughs> yes, welcome to my life. Um, <laughs> Just business as usual in a way but I like to imagine that we could be better at the other end on the other side of this and so you know my question is what hope do you have for the future do you think it's possible that there might be good things to come out of this for us as a society or what would you want to happen I, I always want to believe that people are generally good right and um this is lessons we teach our daughter all the time is that people are generally good you should be you know cautious of about you know because you're a girl a girl you're a woman in the world and so you need to be extra cautious but in general people are good and they they will come together and support each other and i see amazing things every day i see you know people i see young people you know delivering uh, ice cream to our elderly neighbors and i i, I see acts of kindness all over the place. Um, and maybe when we come out of this, maybe there'll be less of a focus on this just constant striving, constant striving and constant busyness. And this is all maybe teaching us to be still for a little while. And that's extremely uncomfortable, especially for people who have been in the fast lane and on autopilot for most of their lives. Uh, but it's a good discomfort because at the other side of it, there's growth. There's, there's going to be personal growth. And uh, even at the level of our, you know, the, the film productions are, are going to be more mindful. The tattoo studio is going to be more mindful and more careful and more thoughtful, even more so than we were before about the health and safety of uh, the people that work there and uh, other fellow human beings. So I do have a lot of faith that, you know, we're gonna see good change come out of this. Well, um, cheers to that. <laughs> yeah. Yes, cheers. Thank you for having me. This has been so nice. I've been like, I don't, I don't think I've caught up with a friend in a little while. I should do more of this. It's, uh, it's uh, nice to see you, Blondie. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you when the tattoo shop reopens. Okay. All right. All Stay right. safe. Stay Bye. Safe.